introduce myself. Uh, I'm the executive pastor here, and I get to serve on the preaching team. And uh, if I haven't met you yet, I, I'd love to get to meet you. Uh, I want to say thanks for being here. Uh, so let's dig into this sermon. Are we there yet? I mean, that question, are we there yet? That question that's like nails on a chalkboard to any parent on any sort of trip. Or the questions that are like that, right? How much longer? When are we getting there? Will we ever get there? Or my personal favorite, can we go back home when we're we've almost there, right? That question that starts within the first, I don't know, like five minutes and continues on until you're there or you begin to shake with so much fury that your loving child is afraid that you might just blow that's a question that everyone who has ever driven a child or with a child ever has experienced, right? If you, or if you've ever been a child, you've said to yourself, I know I have, uh, and now I know what I've put my parents through, and I, I feel bad for them. And, and I have to tell you, bless you for anyone who has ever driven a child before there were screens or any in-car entertainment. That's amazing. You're the real heroes, so proud of you. <laughs> so glad I don't have to do that. Uh, now, of course, I think the reason that, the, that why that question gets to me so much, and hopefully you can identify with this as well, it's because I don't want to be in the car any longer either. I'm ready to get there. I just want to get there immediately. I feel just like how my kids feel. And I think we all yearn to some extent to get there. To get to the destination, whatever that destination is. And for some of us, that destination, it's financial independence or whatever it is, that amount that's going to get us to be able to retire with some security or for our business to be successful. For others, it maybe it's climbing to the top of the corporate ladder or just getting through maybe one more week at work, getting to the weekend. For parents, it can be to get through the summer, right? Uh, for students, it can be to get to the summer and through another year of school. And as you begin this week, for many of us, uh, you really are feeling that. Or for those high achievers, it's to get into the college of your dreams and to get the, the job of your dreams. Or maybe to take this in a little bit more of a spiritual direction. I, mean, I, I have at times longed for Christ's return, just aching for Christ to come back soon, for just actual and complete like peace just to be here. I mean, when you're dealing with the sin and the pain and trials, all the things that my friend John, he preached about last week, I mean, we just want him to come back. Every time another mass shooting happens, I get more ready for Christ to return. I mean, we didn't have to drill for a possible active shooter when I was a kid. And now the preschool, the preschool that my kids are at, they run active shooter drills more often than they do tornado drills. I mean, it's crazy. And I'm glad that they do it. But I yearn for the world to be right again, for peace, for safety, for us and for our children, or to have the power to be able to make it stop. And so I think that we can identify with the apostles when they ask this question of Jesus, are you going to restore the kingdom? And so we've been going through this series over the summer called Define the Relationship, as you can see, like multiple places on the wall. Uh, and the, as we've been going through that, we've been talking about our identity as the church, how we're a family, the body of Christ, a temple, God's embassy in the world, a flock. And now the last few weeks have been into what the church does, right? What marks a church? A church, it preaches God's word. A church worships God. And that takes us to today. A church witnesses to the world. You see, one of the biggest purposes of the church is to witness. One of the most important things for a church to do, one of the essential marks of a church is that a church witnesses, and in, in Acts 1, 6 through 11, as Scott read, we'll, we'll see Jesus' bold prediction of what the disciples will do in a promise to return. Now, if you have a Bible and you haven't already turned to Acts 1, now's your chance. Go for it. 
turn there. And like John said last week, we do highly encourage you uh, to bring one, whether it's on your phone or it's a bound one. Either way, we'd love for you to bring a Bible to church. Because the relevant passages are going to be on the screen, but hey, you might want to look at the context around where we are, or you might want to take some notes. By the way, while I'm talking about notes, I do want to point out real quick uh, something that a a couple ways you can get the sermon notes. If you didn't notice on your way in, at the back of the uh, worship center here, we have sermon notes in a bunch of baskets and like all of the aisles. Feel free to get up and grab one if you happen to have a pen. I'm not going to feel bad about that, and so neither should you. Uh, The second place you can get your notes is on our updated app. There's a section at the bottom that's titled Sundays. If you tap on that, you can then tap on a thing that's called a section called Sermon Notes. You just tap on that, and you can start taking notes right on your phone, so you don't have to bring a pen with you, which is pretty great, because I always forget to bring a pen. Now, if you don't have the app, we said this earlier, but you can just text Longview FBC app to 77977 and follow the link that you're sent. Uh, that's also in the bulletin in case you don't remember the second I just said that. Uh, but that info's in the bulletin. It's easy to set up, and you have access to the notes and all of the stuff that the church does as well. So having said that, now let me get you uh, a bit of context just to set the scene for what's going on in the book of Acts. Acts, it's the second volume in a two-volume set and written by Luke. So the first one you've probably guessed is the Gospel of Luke. The second one is Acts. So as Acts opens up, we see that Jesus, he's been crucified on the cross for the sins of the world. And then that he resurrected, and he didn't just resurrect like a ghost or something like that, but as a real in flesh breathing person with a glorified body that could actually pass through walls, which I've always thought is pretty cool. I mean, just my opinion, but that's crazy. So Jesus, he spends 40 more days with this group of men that he spent his time with before his crucifixion, with the apostles. And he shows them lots of ways that he's alive again, offering what the text calls proofs. And he promises them that the Holy Spirit's going to come very soon, and and not many days is what the text says. And that's where we come to verse 6, where we're digging in today. And it's in verses 6 through 8 that we see this first promise, the promise to be witnesses. Jesus promises the disciples, the apostles, that they will be witnesses. Now, I want you to to do something for me for a second. Put yourselves in the shoes or maybe the sandals is a better way of thinking it, of the apostles. Think of yourself, put yourself in their shoes. See the world through their eyes. Imagine that you're one of the apostles. I mean, you have to be pretty confused at this point. Nothing that had happened over the last few months had gone according to what you thought was going to happen. It didn't go according to, to your plan. When Jesus called you from whatever you were doing, whether it was a fisherman or a tax collector or whatever you were doing, you thought you had been called to be a part of this this Jewish renewal movement, the restoration of Israel, the restoration of their country. And so you thought Jesus, he was the Messiah. He's appointed as the true king of Israel. Even, Even if most everyone, they just thought you were crazy for believing that. But you did. And you saw Jesus as a return to something like King David in the Old Testament. You remember that? So back in the Old Testament, while David's waiting to be king, he gathered up men to be with him. And they wandered through the wilderness, sleeping in caves and those sorts of things. But then David, he actually did become king. And those men, that ragtag group of men that followed him around, they became his his mighty men. They became the highest and the most powerful officials in all of Israel. And so you thought, hey, that's what Jesus is going to do now. But then he gets executed. He gets executed by the Romans, crucified on a hill outside of Jerusalem. And so you thought for sure you must be wrong. He couldn't be the Messiah. The Messiah doesn't get killed by the ones he's supposed to overthrow. But then the most amazing thing happens. This blows your mind. He raises from the dead. What in the world does that even mean? Does it, does it, it must mean the renewed kingdom of Israel is back on track. That thing that we had thought for the last few years was happening is going to happen now. Are we almost there? Will we get to rule and reign with Jesus? Will it be like David's men, only somehow even better? I mean, can you see where they're coming from? 
They have all of these expectations from what they understand Jesus to be. And so with that context, look at verse 6 with me. And in verse 6, it says, So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Right? It makes sense that they wonder, are we there yet? I mean, but they've been through a lot. So they ask, are you going to restore the kingdom now? And Jesus, he gives them the answer, which, they, which wouldn't, didn't really answer their question. Instead, he gives them, honestly, the answer that a lot of questions, a lot of parents give when we're asked that question. We'll get there when we get there, right? I mean, he says at ver- in verse 7, he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Okay, by the way, I want you to notice this. He doesn't say that the kingdom is never going to be restored to Israel. He just says it's not for you to know when. Basically, he says you don't need to know. But that's not all he says. He continues in verse 8, and he says in verse 8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So they thought that he'd tell them when his kingdom, when the kingdom would be restored, but Jesus, he gives them this promise instead. And this promise involves three Ps. The promise involves a person, power, and a program. The person of Jesus Christ, the one that they're witnessing about, the power of the Holy Spirit to complete this promise and a program that starts where they are and ends up over all the earth. First, that power that they thought they'd receive from being in charge of things, well, not so much. That's not happening for them, right? But the power that they're going to get, it's so much greater than just having high positions in some government. This is the kind of power that can only come from God himself, because it is God himself. It's divine power. So do you see what he says? He says, He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. That's Holy Spirit power that makes all the other kind of power that we might seek after like nothing. Okay, but why does Jesus give them this incredible power, this Holy Spirit? The reason here, it's so that they will be witnesses. Look at verse 8 again. And you will be my witnesses. You see, it's something that it's not really clear in English here. Uh, This looks like a command, but it's actually, it's more like a statement of fact. The Greek language makes it really clear that this isn't Jesus telling them something to do, but it's more like giving them a promise. It's more like telling them a prophecy. He's telling them what's going to happen with the rest of their lives. For Jesus, this is like stating a fact. This is what's happening. This is what's going to happen in your life. I know because I'm Jesus. See, here's what's going to happen. You're going to be my witnesses. You see, they weren't called to be theologians or philosophers or leaders, but witnesses. Whatever else they could become in the future, that's not their primary thing. They will be witnesses. Now, what's a witness, right? There's two parts to being a witness. First, a witness, it sees something, and then he says something. It's pretty simple. He sees something, and then he says something. A witness experiences something. And they tell other people what they've experienced. So these men, they saw this person, Jesus. They knew Jesus. They knew what Jesus said, what he did, who he was, everything about him. And so they would tell people what he said, did, everything they experienced in their life with him. Okay, but I got to tell you, there's, there's a problem with eyewitnesses. Uh, you see, I was watching this episode on Netflix of Adam Runs Everything. Some people have heard of the show. It's a funny show, uh, if you haven't seen it. Anyway, he had this expert on the show here, and this expert makes the case that eyewitness testimony is actually incredibly unreliable. Now, here's an example that's dear to my heart of why they're unreliable. Now, Matlock. Has anyone ever seen Matlock? Okay, I'm going to take that as a yes. Uh, And I might be dating myself, but I loved Andy Griffith as Matlock. I mean, I watched it all the time when I was a kid. Andy, he pretty much made this point kind of the turning point of every show that he was on. Well, that and they would actually find the actual killer, but that was the other turning point. So Matlock, he, would, he was the, this expert defense attorney. 
And on this show, you see, he would regularly get this eyewitness in front of a jury. And this eyewitness would swear that he saw his client do this, this terrible crime. And on the show, what would happen is he'd get them in front and he'd convince the eyewitness that what he saw, what he was so certain that he saw was not actually what he saw. It was always, it was awesome to see. And it made for a pretty great show, but it's based on real life. I mean, that happens when, when, with things that we see. So we have to ask that question. How do we know that something similar didn't happen with the apostles, that they just kind of thought they saw this, but it wasn't actually the case? Well, there's two ways that we can know that they're accurate. First, more than just one of them saw this. There's more than just one. There were a bunch. There were 11 now. Judas is no more. Those men that were incredibly close to Jesus and saw and spent a lot of time with him, they would have known if this was all a bunch of lies. And then as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, Jesus appeared to more than 500 at one time after his resurrection. And then I think also is important, maybe more importantly for our context, they have the power of the Holy Spirit to be accurate. And so they did all of this through the power of the Holy Spirit, through that divine power. So then the last P, he gave them a program. Look at verse 8 with me again. And in verse 8, it says, you will be my witnesses. This is Jesus talking. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So this map should give you an idea of what I'm talking about here. You see, they're going to start in Jerusalem. It's in the top right corner. Actually, it's kind of right there where you see Palestine. And then there's Jerusalem right above Judea. It's like that little dot. That's Jerusalem. And then they expand to Judea and Samaria. And so it goes a little further. And then to the ends of the earth, which as far as the apostles knew was basically everything on this map of maybe a little bit more. But there was basically everything that's in that map, plus a bit. Now, this is amazing that as you read through the book of Acts, as you read through the rest of Acts, this is actually what happens. In fact, you can outline Acts from this verse. You see, the church, it starts in Jerusalem, and then it moves to Judea and Samaria. And Acts ends with Paul in Rome, for them, pretty much the end of the world. But even at the end of the book, you can tell that the the gospel is continuing powerfully to go even beyond that. And so you can see that it's beginning to reach to the end of the world, to everywhere. And you can see that in the book of Acts. Now, what's more here is that we are here because of this program. Every one of us in here who are believers are here because of the witnessing power of the church. And then that's an amazing thing to think about. Something that was written this long ago and has started half the world away. And we're here because of it. 2,000 years later, we are believers because people listened by the power of the Holy Spirit and continued on. And another thing, as you read through Acts, you notice something else here. It's not just the apostles that did this. At the end of the book, Paul, he gets to Rome. But the craziest thing about Paul when he's in Rome is there are already believers there. It's remarkable. The story that's following Paul, and he's pushing so long in this book to get to Rome. And there's already believers there. You see, this promise to the apostles, it's not just to the apostles. The promise is to all of us. The promise to be Jesus' witnesses with the power of the Holy Spirit is to all disciples. Throughout the book of Acts and the rest of the Bible, all the way to today, this promise is just as true for us as it was for them. We have the power of the Holy Spirit. We have the person of Jesus. And we have the program of reaching out to be witnesses. But for us to be witnesses, we have to experience something to witness. We have to see something to have something to say. But I think we can all agree that we didn't experience Jesus directly like the apostles did. We didn't spend three years walking beside them, three years that transformed every single one of them, that transformed the rest of their lives. So what do we experience? Well, we do experience Jesus in at least two ways. First, through God's word. We read eyewitness testimony of what happened, what he said 
all sorts of things in the Gospels, in the book of Acts. And we read about the impact on the world in the letters of Paul and Peter and John and on and on. And so we witness what happened through God's word. Second, through our own personal experience, right? We experience Jesus and we're transformed by the experience of Jesus. So I went to Bruce Campbell's funeral this week. He was an army veteran in Vietnam. But what stood out to me most in his memorial service is that his life was transformed by experiencing Jesus. He was living, he was a living witness to the power of Christ to change a life. Now, it wasn't in the typical way that you'd expect. I mean, he didn't go around telling everyone about Jesus all the time. I mean, he was actually a man of very few words. He just lived so differently after he experienced Jesus that people noticed. And the people that would get up and speak spoke about that. It was amazing to experience that and to be able to be a part of that service. It was a powerful memorial service. You see, that's what it can look like to witness, letting God use us through how he's made us in our gifting and in our personality. And so we experience Jesus and we are so transformed by this love, this gospel, this amazing power that we can't help but share it. I mean, that's the reason it's the mission of fellowship. And it's our tagline, experiencing Jesus and transforming lives, because we believe that's what happens. As we experience Jesus, our lives are transformed. So the first promise is to be witnesses through the power of the Holy Spirit. But there's a second promise here. And the second is the promise to return. The promise to return. Look at verse 9. And in verse 9, he says, Or it says, and when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. So Jesus ascends into heaven in a cloud. Now the cloud, cloud, it's a display of God's glory, of God's Shekinah glory. Like on Mount Sinai, when, when Moses met with God, there was a cloud. Or at the transfiguration, when the three apostles, they, they heard the father speak again, cloud. I mean, that must have been kind of an amazing sight, right? Even for people who had seen Jesus do a lot of miracles, even rising from the dead to just Jesus just straight up like floating into heaven. It must have been jaw dropping. Like, and at least this is kind of how I picture it, like Superman floating up. Like that's how I see it happening. Like Jesus just started floating up and he gets enveloped by a cloud and then he's gone. I mean, it must have just been shocking to them. Now, I don't think the apostles were expecting that. I mean, they asked Jesus this question about the kingdom, right? He thinks, and then they're thinking he's going to say, well, when this is happening. And instead, he tells them they're going to be witnesses. And then he just kind of starts to float away. I mean, they just must have been like, wow, that's unexpected. Didn't expect that to happen. So now why do I think they're in shock? Not just because I wanted to make a joke, because... Look what they did. They did what most of us would have done. They just kind of stared up into the sky for a while, kind of looking at the cloud, I'm guessing. Look at verse 10. And in verse 10, while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes. Now, these men, they're angels. I'll just, you know, cut the suspense there. They're angels. The white robes are signifying that they're angels. They're this angelic presence. They're often are shown with white robes. Now, verse 11, and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? Now, I think the proper response would be, did you see that? Like, of this is why we're staring, but they didn't say anything. And the angels, they keep talking. They say, this Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. You see the angels, they said this promise and it gave the apostles, it gave them hope and confidence the promise that Jesus will return. But they get even more specific than that, right? They, they say that he's going to return the same way, the same way that they just saw him go into heaven. Now, how does that give them confidence? Why does that give them confidence? Well, let me give you another parenting illustration. Hey, I'm sorry, this is the air I breathe. I'm a parent, that's what I live. So and with school starting this week, or uh, for some of y'all last week, maybe you're experiencing this right now. Uh, When we drop our kids off, 
Now, hey, maybe you experienced this this morning when you dropped your kids off. When we drop our kids off, especially our youngest, he can get really sad, like wailing, sad. You have to kind of pry him off of you. So as a parent, how do you reassure them? You reassure them by saying, hey, we're going to return. We promise we're going to return. It's how every parent I've ever seen reassures their toddlers. I don't see any parent ever dropping off a screaming toddler saying, hey, we might be back. I, maybe not. I don't know. If you calm down, I might come back. I mean, just no one does that. We all promise we're going to return. And sometimes it actually does reassure and calm them. Sometimes they're still children after all. Uh, but, because, but it's because they have the confidence that they can trust you. You said you're going to return, and so far, you always have. And so they believe that they believe you. And it's what Jesus did, too. The angels promised he'll return, and it gave the apostles confidence and, reassur- and the reassurance to get moving because they knew they could trust Jesus. I mean, even though they didn't really pick up on this, Jesus did tell them that he was going to die and be raised three days later, and then he actually did that. They have so many reasons to believe him. And so then they were given two, so they were given two promises. One, that they would be witnesses with the power of the Holy Spirit throughout the world. And two, that Jesus would return from heaven, and that gave them all of the confidence they needed to be able to go out in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, here's the point and the point of the passage. The point, the church has the power to witness boldly to the world, knowing Christ will return. The church has the power to witness boldly to the world, knowing Christ will return. Our church, Fellowship Bible Church, has the power of the Holy Spirit to witness to the world about Christ. You, if you're a believer, have the power of the Holy Spirit to witness Christ to the world. And by the way, if you want to know how to become a believer, come and talk to me anytime, anytime at all. I'd love to share this simple gospel with you and answer any questions that you have. But if you're a believer in here, how you witness can look incredibly different depending on your unique gifting and your personality. Now, you might have the gift of evangelism. So you, I've seen, and I've seen this, and it's amazing to see. You can turn any conversation into being about Jesus. You might be an incredibly outgoing person, and so it's no big deal for you to talk to strangers, and you can connect them to Christ. Maybe you connect with people really well one-on-one, and so you use that to witness to people. Maybe it's through how well you love them, and, and you share and listen to them. Or you might not talk much, but you can show people how your life was transformed through Christ. I guess here, here's what I'm saying. You, we don't have the excuse of, well, I don't have the gift of evangelism. Or you don't have the excuse of, I'm not outgoing enough. Or we really don't have any excuse. You see, that didn't matter at all to Jesus. It didn't matter at all when Jesus promised that we would be witnesses. We have the power of the Holy Spirit that empowers us to witness boldly. So I became a believer when I was young. But when I was in high school, way back when, forever ago, I hid my faith. I distinctly remember I didn't want to be a zealot. Yes, I used that word. I was kind of a nerd. And I thought to myself, but I thought to myself all the time, "Ah, I just don't want to be considered a zealot. I don't want people to think that I'm this religious zealot type who goes around telling everyone about Jesus. Just how dare they think that about me? And I know it was kind of crazy, but that's kind of what high school is like. We all just, I was trying to fit in. I didn't want to have anything that might make me different, even if that meant Jesus would make me different. Now, I don't fail to witness because I'm afraid people are going to think I'm a zealot anymore, in case you weren't sure, just so you all know. Don't worry about that. Being a pastor kind of lets the cat out of the bag with that. They know you're about Jesus. They already know. But I still do fail to witness. Now, though, it's got to, it has more to do with busyness, right? I get sucked into doing so much work that I don't find the time to connect with people who aren't a part of the church or of any church. Imagine that, though. I mean, it's, kind of, it's, it's shameful to me. A pastor too busy to share the gospel with people. But it's true. And it's something that I have to confess that I fight with 
constantly to not be too busy to share the gospel. Now, fortunately, I know I'm not alone. This busyness, it's reached epic proportions in America. It's a fairly consistent response whenever you ask people how they're doing. They say, I'm so busy. We wear it kind of like a badge of honor, as though it makes us important and powerful because we're busy. We stack our to-do list so high that there's no way we will ever get it all accomplished. And I pity that poor soul who might try to interrupt us from getting our stuff done. Now I'm kind of preaching to myself here, so take that with a grain of salt. You see, though, what we think makes us important, it's just us having our priorities out of whack. So what do we do here? What should we do with this? Should we all start going door to door with gospel tracts? I mean, maybe if you're gifted in that way, that might be what you should do. But I want to encourage you to take the next step that might be a bit more simple, but can also be incredibly powerful in the midst of our hectic lives. Here's what I'd like for you to try this week. Just try this and see what happens. Let God work and just see what happens. Pray This prayer, pray that God would set up divine interruptions this week. Ask God to interrupt your life and to use you to talk with someone about Jesus. Some people actually call these divine appointments because it's God that has set that appointment up. And what we consider to be an interruption is so often God making an appointment for us to be able to share the gospel. Now, don't just pray that one time and then be done with it. Pray it regularly. Pray it consistently. Set up a trigger to remind yourself to make that prayer. Maybe for every time you get in the car on your way to work or uh, to school, you pray that God gives you a divine interruption, a divine appointment for you. Or when you get ready, maybe every time you brush your teeth in the morning, and if you brush your teeth at night, good for you, then you do that twice a day, and you do that prayer twice a day. Just pray this simple prayer. Pray, God, set up a divine appointment with me for someone this week. And then you can't just stop there. Be responsive when it happens. Be responsive to the Holy Spirit when he puts someone across your path. I mean, maybe it's a phone call you didn't expect. It could be that someone you work with starts to open up to you in a way that had never, he had never before. It could be a thousand different things, but the key is to pray and watch for it, to recognize this interruption and not avoid it, and then let the Holy Spirit use you in that interruption. Don't ignore God interrupting your life with someone that might need to hear the gospel. Lean into the interruption. Let your plans be interrupted. Let your plans be changed for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of witnessing. Again, preaching to myself here. Now, there's a few option, other options for next steps that are on the sermon outline, and I encourage you to take a look at that and consider doing those as well. But I want to focus on this one because I think that all of us can pray some short prayers this week and be responsive to the Holy Spirit who dwells within us and empowers us to witness. So church, fellowship, we have the power to witness boldly to the world knowing Christ will return. We have that power, power that can only come from the Holy Spirit because he dwells within us so that we can, so that we will witness boldly to the world, to our neighbors, our loved ones, our families, our coworkers, our classmates, people on our floor, people we come across at the, at the grocery store, at the department store, online, so that as we are interrupted, we are able to love well and witness boldly. And we can be confident that Christ will return, so our hope is not false. Will you pray with me in that direction? Father God, we thank you that you sent your son to live the life we couldn't live, to die the death that we deserve because we are sinners. And we thank you that three days later, he rose again in newness of life and that he was brought up to your right hand where he intercedes on our behalf even now. And Father, we pray for those in here right now that don't yet believe that 
that you would work powerfully even at this moment to convict them of their sin, to overwhelm them with your love? Would you use us in their life to show your love? Grant them boldness to talk with a believer about you. And Father, we confess that we have failed to be responsive to the Spirit at times. We failed to be witnesses of your Son, to share how he has transformed our life. But we thank you for your forgiveness. And we pray for this week. We pray that you would set up interruptions in our lives this week. We pray that you would bring people across our path. For every believer in here, we pray that you would bring someone across our path this week, that we would lean into the Holy Spirit and what he is doing in their lives and is that interruption as we see it is an appointment by you. And that a life could be transformed by our sharing the gospel. But we know that it is not our power that does that, but by your power that brings anyone to you. And so if right now we pray for your power for the Holy Spirit to empower us to be witnesses to the people that we come across, so that we can be witnesses to the world. May we notice when you do bring someone across us and stop and be your witnesses by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's in the name of the Son and by the power of the Spirit that we pray. Amen. I want to ask the prayer team to come up. And while they're coming up, I do want to say, I want to tell you guys, they, they and I would love to talk and pray with you about anything at all. We'll stick around for here uh, for a little bit after the service. Please come up as everyone else is leaving. While folks are leaving, you can walk right up here. Not a big deal. Just come up. We'll talk. It'll be great to talk and we'll pray with you. Now, while they're coming up, let me close with this. Our God is powerful. He is in control and incredibly loving. And we have experienced him and our lives have been transformed, forever changed. So may we go, may we go this week confident that as we pray for divine interruptions, that he will bring someone across our path as a divine appointment. Now let's pay attention when he does and lean into that appointment. Thank you for being here. Uh, We'll see you next week when Todd finishes up our sermon series.